Good morning, Prof. Hadaymi. Is the teacher connected? OK, juste une minute, le temps de le lui rappeler.
Euh, cher participant, rebonjour. Euh, je, le professeur a un peu, un peu pris pour le moment, donc nous allons recueillir un peu de votre patience. Nous allons démarrer très bientôt dès qu'il pourra nous rejoindre, s'il vous plaît.
Euh, à votre attention, euh, le, le présentateur vient d'être contacté. On lui donne le, le temps de se, de se connecter euh, pour qu'on puisse démarrer. Merci pour votre patience. Bonjour à tout le monde. Est-ce que vous me recevez? Oui, moi je reçois. Oui. D'accord. Bon, désolé pour le retard. Nous, allons, nous avons quelques soucis de connexion. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous avons tardé à démarrer cette session. Bon, je vais... Je ne sais pas si mon collègue de, de, qui doit présenter, monsieur... Euh, Monsieur Adeyinka est présent. Mr. Adeyinka, can you hear me? Are you, are you there? Yeah, yes, I can I'm hear you. Here. Yes, I'm here. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So we are going to start this uh, last live, live session uh, for the course on domestic resource mobilization. Uh, my apologies for... Uh, the slide delay we had today. Uh, so the last presentation is going to be uh, done by my colleague, Mr. Uh, uh, Adeyinka, who is an expert uh, at the Economic Commission of Africa, uh, notably the African Trade Policy Center. So uh, he's very knowledgeable on the issues related to illicit financial flows in Africa, and he is going to uh, present you uh, what has been done at the, the ECA level regarding uh, that topic. Uh, so I don't know whether my colleague can share on the screen uh, his presentation. Charles, bonjour Charles, est-ce que c'est possible de partager la présentation? Oui, oui, bien sûr, allez-y. So uh, while waiting for my colleague to share the, the presentation on the screen, I would like to thank all the participants uh, in this uh, 
last live session. Uh, I know that uh, since the, the very beginning, you are present with us and, and uh, we are very happy, uh, yes, for your enthusiasm to, to follow and to take our training programs very, uh, uh, with um, uh, engagement. So, if you can go on the first slide, please. Okay, uh, without further ado, I will leave the floor to my colleague, Mr. Adeyinka Adeyemi, who is Senior Advisor at the African Trade Policy Center. He is going to take us through his presentation on illicit financial flows in Africa. And uh, after that, uh, there will be a uh, question and answer session. Uh, and uh, the, the presenter will be assisted by the tutor, Mr. Paul Abete. So uh, I, will, <coughs> I will give you the floor. Over to you, Mr. Adinka. Yes, th thank you, colleagues. I, uh, I mean, I don't know whether the slides are visible. Um, and whether- we can, um, we can see, we can see the slides. You can see the slides and then uh, you can see me too. Okay, good, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, uh, anywhere you are. Um, thank you, Aime, and thank colleagues for, for making time for this. We are very sorry, as I said, for this uh, slight, slight delay. It was due to some kind of uh, technical problems that we are experiencing here. So my name is Ye Yinka Diedi, I did Yinka Diedi, but you can call me Yinka Diedi. I work here at the ECA, at the African Trade Policy Center. And the presentation is actually titled uh, deliberately, Illicit Financial Flows from Africa, Track It, Stop It, Get It. And you would know uh, shortly why, why we have done that. Now, just, uh, the, just to give you a synopsis, Generally, what I'm going to do is give you the state of play today. Some of the numbers that we will go through in this presentation were compiled about a year or two ago. So things may have actually worsened up. So if you see $80 billion um, as of two years ago, it is likely $100 billion this year today. So, but if you have a, a more current number, uh, it would be nice to, to hear from you. So what I will do is give a state of play, give a background to the uh, whole uh, illicit financial flows, the, the, the paying attention to the high, you know, high, the high level panel chaired by President Tabombeki. Then let you go through some of the elements, go through what we can do, and then, uh, and then uh, take questions. I'll try and make it as interactive as possible Please stop me if you if I'm going too fast. Stop me if you have a question. Uh, and but if you have an argument or a counter argument, wait for the presentation to end. Then we'll take the argument. Okay. So generally, um, the, the the recent development. Keep in mind what I said: that tax evasion and theft. So we we, we just call it theft instead of all these. Uh, Hyperlutian uh, concept, it's stealing is stealing. The tax evasion and theft rob Africa of about $89 billion every year. Now, this is likely more uh, in 2022, uh, as uh, the number I just gave you was an uncut uh, study of 2020. So we are, we are talking about export of gold, diamonds, platinum, and so on and so forth. The US, is actually a money laundering mecca. Uh, this is uh, an article in the Washington Post uh, in 2022. It says our legal system, our legal system, corporate lawyers, bankers, real estate agents are eager to turn dirty money into gold. The fact that America welcomes dirty money from abroad is no secret. Now, I suggest to you that what is true for America is probably true for Switzerland. It's probably true for all other havens, even within Africa. And we will go through those uh, shortly too. There was an article also in Boston Street uh, a couple of years ago, the deadly terror networks and drug cartels. 
you know, use huge banks to finance their crimes. So these are some of the things, and uh, there's another a couple of uh, uh, items. HSBC, you all know HSBC is an international bank. The article says move HSBC move Ponzi scheme millions despite warning. That was a B on BBC, and then the Financial Crime Enforcement Network files. It says that behind the scenes, ICIJ assembled 400 reporters from 88 countries to investigate suspicious bank transactions linked to criminal, criminals and businesses in more than 100 countries. So you can check some of these things are there. You can check them out uh, after, after this uh, presentation, or you can, uh, we can do bilateral uh, you know, uh, chats uh, by email. So let's give some background and facts. We all know, we are familiar with Agenda 2023 and the SDGs. We, it's a fact that we are going to need huge resources uh, to implement these two initiatives, especially for in Africa. Now, such transformation is completely impossible, as we know, through the overseas development assistance or even foreign direct uh, investment. We need our own domestic resources. Uh, otherwise, uh, and we have to stop the IFF, which is what we will call illicit financial flows. Then, for uh, we need to we need to stop bleeding. Now, further, a development cannot depend on donor financing. That has been established over time. Uh, getting some interrupt interruption. Uh, let me guarantee you, and I, I, I hear anybody to come up with any country in this world that has developed, that has developed through aid or donor support, any country. So we say, at, as an estimate, about 70 billion. I remember Uncle says 89 billion. And I'm suggesting that if you check it today, it might be closer to $100 billion, leaving Africa every year, leaving Africa every year. Keep this in mind when you think about how much money we get in, in terms of aid or in terms of assistance. It is a fraction of what is stolen from Africa. So this is really the, 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 you know, the motivation for the high level panel uh, initiative on illicit financial flows. And so in June 2011, African leaders mandated us as the Economic Commission for Africa and the NEPAD agency, as it was known at that time, to conduct a study into domestic resources mobilization and to suggest workable instruments. Why is that? Because every day, and I, I recall that uh, Prime Minister, late uh, Prime Minister uh, Bele Zenawi, said during one of the meetings, and I was in the room, said every day, every time we hear that Af you know, Africa has enough money. Africa has enough resources. Where are these resources? Where are they? We need to pinpoint where they are so that we can be able to follow them through. Now, that was the, when they asked us to do the study uh, to establish the uh, resources that were available domestically in Africa. We did that study. A few years, uh, it, it was adopted and you will hear about it much later in this presentation. Um, so, uh, well, we've said this. Now, the, the, the truth of the matter is illicit financial flow drain our resources. Uh, and they are serious concern for some reasons. Because, Mr. Yinka. Hello, yeah. Yes, excuse me. Uh, it seems that we have uh, a problem with interpretation. Uh, oh. interpreters, says, uh, interpreters are saying that uh, there is a background noise uh, where you are standing, so I don't know. Background noise, yes. Yeah. Yes, so, so it's a, uh, it's a problem for, for them to interpret what you are saying. Okay, I let me slow down a bit. I am in an office, there's no background noise here at all. So maybe you can check first with them uh, to see whether it's okay. Okay, okay. can they, they, I cannot see them, but can they, if they see me, uh, the interpreters, are you, are you, receiving me loud and clear right now. 
Um, I have no. I'm no response. You, no response from them. Can you get in touch with them? I just I cannot hear them. Mm. Okay. Let, let me uh, call uh, uh, my colleague Charles. Should we Charles? Mm -hmm. Qu'est-ce qui se passe? Oui. Est-ce qu'il peut mettre un casque? Parce que le son là, au niveau de l'interprétation, ils entendent ça très faiblement. Mm. Okay, it seems that uh, your, the sound is very, uh, very low from your side. Do you, do you have a headset? No, no headset. Should I use the headset? I don't. Yes, it. maybe with the headset, uh, it will be better. But if you don't have it. Uh... Yeah, no, I don't have the headset. I, bon, I Charles, have it. Charlie, il n'en a pas. Qu'est-ce qu'on fait? Okay, il n'a qu'à parler doucement et il s'approche du micro. Okay. Okay. So, right. you, you speak so slowly. You speak, okay. Yes, you speak slowly and uh, yes, you make sure that, uh, okay, that uh, they can get you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, all right. We, we, we were talking about the direct impact of uh, illicit financial flows on Africa's uh, development. So uh, if, if we did not have illicit financial flows, we will have another 5% increase in growth, in growth in Africa at, at the minimum. Growth will increase by 5% without illicit financial flows from Africa. Now, because of it, we have high levels of poverty. So we now know that the number of people living on less than 1.25 that is, dollar and a quarter every day increased from 290 million in 1990, 290 million in 1990 uh, to 414 million just ten, you know, within 10 years by 2010. Our resource needs set up, you know, largest, largest youth population, therefore, we have to stand this outflows of illicit, illicit finances. Now, let me tell you quickly about the high level panel that was set up by the African Union to look into this. And the mandate, which we will get to in a few minutes, uh, uh, will also be elaborated. So there were 10 members in the panel. As I said earlier, the, it was presided by President Thabo Mbeki, uh, the former president of South Africa, then the executive secretary of PCA, then Ambassador Apata, uh, the Raymond Baker, that most of you may know from GFI, Dr. Zainab Bashir El Bakir, Abdullah Bill Shan, Aladi Magul, Barrister Akere Muna, that you may know with uh, Transparency International, Ms. Irene Ovonji Odida and Eric Abu. Those are the members who worked on it for years and then uh, presented the report that uh, we, we aptly tried to stop it, uh, track it, stop it, get it. Now, how did they work and how can the work of the HLP, the high level panel on illicit financial flow help, help us in, on the continent. The work yielded the following, uh, it improved capacity of uh, regional, sub-regional and national institutions, as well as other major stakeholders to better comprehend and address the problem of IFA. The, the report shows the impact, shows the pattern, shows the content. Now, secondly, it's improved legal and institutional framework for African countries in tackling the problem. It enhanced regional strategy, collaboration, coordination, and partnership in the fight against IFF on the continent. And it increased technical and policy knowledge, as well as expertise on the problem of IFF in Africa. I encourage you to search for the report it is tied to IFF, track it, stop it, get it. Again, 
we will uh, go in shortly to, to uh, the reasoning behind the, those the slogans. Let's go quickly on some key definitions uh, because uh, sometimes people will say to you, uh, this is not illicit flows. This is, uh, I'm just taking my money out. Now, they defined, uh, the, the high-level panel defined illicit financial flows as any money that is illegally earned, illegally transferred, or illegally utilized. Therefore, if it breaks the law, if that money breaks the law in its origin, in its movement, or in its use, it is illicit financial flow. The movement of such types of money is made with clear intentions to make it disappear from any records in the country of origin. So keep this in mind because you will hear, I'm a businessman. I mean, I've heard this at many international meetings. Uh, that look, if I bring my money into a country and I do business, I have the right to take it out. Uh, and that is not a illicit financial flow. Now, mm -hmm. the counterpoint to that is that if it was designed, if the movement of the money was deliberately designed to disappear from any records in the country of origin, it is not just a business as usual. So keep that in mind. So now we're talking, as I was saying, there was a, you know, you talk about, oh, it's a capital flight. Is it capital flight? Is it a, a repatriation of money? Is it a illicit financial flow? The Mbeki panel's definition focuses on unrecorded capital flows, unrecorded capital flows, which comprises of criminal, corrupt, and commercial activities. So this is not capital flight. It is unrecorded capital flows comprising of criminal, corrupt, and commercial activities. The report also emphasizes the role of governance at both the origin and the destinations of these flows. It underlines policy response that encourages more active role for the state and, and emphasizes the need for better regulatory environment at the national and global levels. Again, we will cover that uh, in this presentation. This next uh, graphic shows you exactly what we've been talking about, you know, so that you can clearly understand it. Uh, what is illegal, I hope you can see my cursor, what is illegal, what is illicit, the, in terms of the capital region, you see laundering, proceeds of crime, abuse of power, market abuse, tax abuse. Um, yes, in terms of composition, composition and size, at the time the Mbeki panel was meeting, the estimate was about $50 billion. Now, keep in mind the UNCTA report that says it is now about 89 billion. The UNCTA report was in 2020, uh, uh, and now we're in 2022. Because of the, 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 the kind of trend and the, the, the magnitude of money leaving the continent on a yearly basis, I will not be surprised if the number is closer to $100 billion every year this time. Uh, you can you can check as you are, as you are listening, and if you have uh, the latest number, so you can let us know uh, during the course of this uh, thing. So here is the composition. Here is the composition, and as well as the size of the illicit financial flows. You can see corruption here, and we will see we will go shortly into why is it we call is five percent corruption. Whenever we allege. Uh, we we'll go to uh, the, this, the Western countries or their multinational corporations, and we are, you know, we we'll speak about illicit financial flows. What usually they say is, you know, you Africans, your governments are very, very corrupt. Monies disappear from your countries because of the corruption of your officers, of your leaders. Now, the panel, the Mbeki panel established that of the fifty billion dollars, of the fifty billion dollars, only about five percent can be attributed to official corruption. Only about five percent. That does not mean that uh, it is not uh, substantial, 
but it just says that we should we should pay attention uh, to the part that is 65 percent which is the commercial transaction as well as uh, 30 percent which is due to organized criminal activities all in all everything matters but we have corruption we have offensive tax avoidance we have a tax evasion people dot customs duties and domestic levies transfer mispricing you know money laundering criminal proceeds market abuse hiding wealth in offshore havens so these things over the last 50 years have robbed africa of over 1 trillion dollars over 1 trillion dollars so what are the enablers what are the push and pull factors of illicit financial flows in terms of the push factors we have double the double taxation agreements the desire to hide illicit wealth poor governance weak regulatory structures tax incentives and weak capacities in terms of the pull factors it is we have a financial secrecy jurisdictions and or tax evils. So now in terms of drivers, the drivers of uh, illicit financial flows, we talk up in three, at three levels, macroeconomic drivers, structural characteristics and overall government. So in terms of, and this uh, was taken directly from the book by uh, Ka, Dika, in 2011, illicit financial flows from the least developed countries looking at 1990 to 2008. So there are three, three levels. In terms of macroeconomic drivers, so it, it, it presents fiscal deficits, high and variable inflation, overvalued real effective exchange rates, negative real rates of return, real GDP growth, and external debt. In terms of structural characteristics, uh, we have a non-inclusive growth which is uh which which was named Gini coefficient which uh, tends to increase the gap between the abs and the abdomen increasing trade openness without oversight you know when uh, com when uh, companies come into your country and they say we are bringing 20 billion dollars 20 million dollars whatever number and then you but we want uh we want 100 years uh tax tax uh, holiday and then you just say, oh, this money is good, carry on. So that, that those are the structural uh, uh, drivers. Then there's reform without regulation, which is tied to what I just said, you, you know, reform without regulation. In terms of overall governance, there are four, corruption, business climate, underground economy, and political instability. You can find more about this in the book by Carr, 2011. Now, the components, as we said, we were talking before, uh, corruption in terms of bribery and embezzlement of national wealth you know, is about 5%. Criminal activities, trading drugs, weapons, and people, 35%. Commercial transaction through multi multinational corporation, 60%. Now, why is this important? When you do your advocacy against illicit financial flows, I guarantee you, you will hear uh, bankers, international bankers, uh, uh, corporate uh, types, you, they will tell you, look, uh, we are just doing business. This is part of business. Uh, and that uh, some of the things you are complaining about really originated from your country and that your people are just corrupt and that's why money is escaping. Keep in mind, if we aggregate all the corruption, all the corruption, it, it is 5%. We can pay attention to it, but let's not lose sight of the big picture. The big picture is the criminal activities, the trading drugs, weapons, and people, so, making up 35% of the illicit financial flows from Africa. And then we are talking about commercial transactions. And most African countries have uh, multilateral, you know, multinational corporations. And they, and they, they are, they, they, they are responsible for 60% of the illicit financial flows. 
So if we are going to do a policy or we are going to go after illicit financial flows, we are going to track it, we are going to uh, stop it and get it. We have to pay attention to commercial transactions, uh, pay attention to multinational corporations, pay attention to criminal activities. And of course, even though it is 5% official corruption making the bribery and investment of national wealth. So the channels generally, the channels are trade. So how is it done? This is what, what we, are, we are talking about here. How is it done? Trade misinvoicing. We will, we will talk about that later. Transfer pricing, investment related transfer, offshore financial banking centers and tax havens. And I'm sure uh, without mentioning names, even within Africa, we have a few of these uh, uh, tax havens where people take money and lodge. You will recall the Panama Papers, and then you know exactly what we are talking about. So uh, just uh, briefly, so just to conceptualize some of these things, when we talk about shifting profits from one jurisdiction to another, uh, that is abusive transfer pricing. We shift profit from one jurisdiction to another, uh, that is from a higher tax uh, uh, jurisdiction to a lower one. Why? Because you just don't want to pay tax or you want to pay less. Businesses will argue that it is a logical business decision. But it is illicit financial flows if the action entails manipulating the price of transaction. Remember that because they say that they'll say, look, uh, if I if I know where to pay less, why should I pay higher? Our argument, born by studies, is that if the action makes you manipulate the price of your transaction, then it is illicit. Now, in terms of false invoicing, you know, we falsely declare the value of imports or export in order to evade taxes, in order to evade customs duties, circumvent quotas, or launder money. So you generally, you, the exports are understated and imports are overstated. So proceeds are shifted overseas illicitly. That is false invoicing. Now, base erosion and profit shifting, what does, what does that mean? It means that tax planning strategies which exploit gaps and mismatches in tax rules to make profit disappear. So you use tax planning strategies to make sure to, to make profit disappear for tax purposes. We, during this, uh, the work of the panel, we visited a few countries. And two of the countries which I will not mind mentioning, Nigeria and Kenya. In Kenya, they, talk, they found companies that have been in business for over 20 years, but never, never made one profit. And they never went out of business. Go figure, how, how does that make sense? That you've been in business for 20 years and you never you never made profit. And then uh, you're, you're still in business and hiring people and paying salaries. So uh, the, the, this is what base erosion and profit shifting is all about. You, you use tax planning strategies uh, to, to exploit gaps, uh, legal sometimes, those gaps are there legally uh, to just make profit disappear. So you look like uh, you're you are just doing business um, for, for doing business sake, but uh, you are not making money, but you are really making money. Now, what are the impacts? What are the impact, the development consequences of illicit financial flows? The first one, very, very critical, is that we lose multiplier effects for growth and job creation. Usually, sometimes when you spend $1 properly, that $1 can can, in terms of multiplier effect, can result in the two, three dollars. Now, if you steal fifty billion dollars from the continent, you virtually cripple the, the multiplier effect for growth and job creation because the money is just not there. You don't invest it, you cannot multiply. Now, Africa's capital stock will have expanded by over 60%. 60%. And its GDP per capita will have increased by about 15% without illicit financial flows. 
rate of domestic investment to GDP will have risen from 19 to 30 percent. Leveraging effect of state intervention, for example, to build infrastructure, fiscal effect, and austerity. We have further then with the discouraging transformation, illicit financial flows discourages transformation and transparency. It strains Africa's capacity. It undermines international development co cooperation because our global efforts to promote partnerships for aid effectiveness and development effectiveness are directly undercut by these flows. Now, what are the responses to some of the fallacies that you will hear? Many times when you go out, you will hear from, from the people that you are, you are engaging um, who work for multilateral, multinational uh, corporations. Remember that that's responsible for 60% of the, of the problem. They say, oh, this is not significant because it is only confined, IFF is confined to resource-rich countries like Sudan, like Angola and Nigeria. They say, oh, there's no universal agreement anyway on key concepts that uh, what you call illicit financial flows is a function of your own understanding and where you are, uh, that we, we don't have, we don't universally agree on, on what it means. Uh, in, you know, illicit financial mm -hmm. flows, invoicing, financial pricing can be whatever it is. Now that FDI, this is the most atrocious argument that FDI comes with some illicit financial flow, that every foreign direct investment is accompanied uh, necessarily with some illicit financial flow. Now, there are responses to this. In the past, I personally have been in meetings where senior officials of IMF, of uh, Africa Development Bank, and even the World Bank have made this kind of assertion at in the international forum. We think they are completely, completely wrong because illicit financial flows do not affect only, only three countries. In fact, as you will see in this table, there, there are 10, these are the 10 most affected countries. Uh, and you see the second column the, you know, from 1970 to 2008. This is an old study uh, on Carr and Cartwright Smith, 2010. <laughs> and you will see that Nigeria, in terms of cumulative IFF, is $217 billion. That is virtually almost one third of all the IFFs uh, from Africa, followed by Egypt followed by South Africa, then Morocco, Angola, Algeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Sudan, Ethiopia, and Republic of Congo. These are the first 10 countries most affected. So this is not virtually uh, the argument, the argument of, uh, of, of this, uh, uh, this, of, this officials of uh, multilateral international uh, organization is really virtually false, it cannot be. So we'll see the 10, it's not uh, uh, the, the 10 most affected countries are listed there. Uh, and the, the, the size of their flows, the share in, in terms of uh, total, total, uh, I mean, the total, total uh, IFFs. Now here, this slide here, we see, this slide here, we see what it means in terms of sub -region. In terms of sub regions, right? The, you will see that North Africa, North Africa, Central Africa, West Africa, East Africa, East Africa, Eastern Africa, sorry, and then Southern Africa. So you can see that in terms of share, this, uh, this is sub regional uh, allocation. Uh, the, where, where it is most uh, problematic, West Africa, where it is most problematic in West Africa, and then uh, I'm sorry about the, for the interruption, and then uh, the North Africa, Central, 
Eastern and Southern. So in terms of the argument that, the, remember the argument that uh, we don't have brought, you see the, the second argument there that there's no universal agreement on key concepts. We also controvert that because we say that uh, in a world where there's agreement on what good governance, remember when uh, the, the countries want to attack us as African countries, they'll say, um, you know, you have to improve on good governance. They, they don't. They don't say that you know, there's ambiguity on what good governance means. They know what drug trafficking means, and crucially, they know what pornography means. There's no confusion about these things. So why do we think that it's confusion on what constitutes illicit financial flows, money that you are taking out of our continent uh, with criminal intention? So. And lastly, it is not true that IFFs come with FDIs. It is not true. And one of the argument we make is that some of the some of the uh, countries uh, leaders in uh, in uh, foreign direct investment, uh, the leader is probably China. And I dare you, I dare you to go to China and try try and uh, and do some of the things that you do in some African countries. And then you'll be able to see quickly that foreign direct investments do not necessarily come with illicit financial flow as the argument goes. So the FDI and IFFs are not bedfellows necessarily. It is a weak, weak uh, argument. We cannot say arm robbers are good businessmen. So we must reject that kind of blackmail if we have to move forward. Armed robbers are not businessmen. So FBI and IFFs are not necessary bedfellows. Good business does not embrace IFF. Now, just as I said earlier on, there are 2,000 Chinese companies at the minimum as at uh, 2018, 2,000 Chinese companies investing in Africa. Chinese FDI increased 72% to 2.54 billion by 2013 and by 2018 to 5.4 billion. So some of the top recipients of FDI in 2018 were South Africa, DRC, Mozambique, Zambia, and Ethiopia. So there is this confusion with profit repatriation. You know, profit repatriation, and when we talk about the Peter model law, you know, later you will see that, that even the African heads of state do not oppose uh, property repatriation. They have, uh, they have said you should do it, but you cannot have criminal intent. You cannot hide what you are repatriating. It has to be recorded. It has to be seen. So the argument that FDI is equal to IFF is not never, never made about developed countries with massive FDI. Nobody makes that. The United States gets about 50% of total global outbound FDI flows. And you can see that nobody, nobody in the United States today will say, oh, because we are getting 50% of all FDI flows, we can tolerate some, uh, some, mm -hmm. some illicit financial flows. So what am I saying? Reject that argument because the argument is not made outside of Africa, where FDI is huge and constant and it is, uh, you know, it's, it's flowing. So what do we do? We have to accelerate the implementation of all the global frameworks of IFF. We have to unpack and clarify all the fallacies that they throw at us, either from the World Bank, IMF, African Development Bank, anywhere, anybody who throws this at us, we have to say, no, 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 this is not true. Now, there is a paragraph uh, that you have to pay attention to, the, the Financing for Development uh, Outcome, uh, this outcome, in paragraph 23, in paragraph 23, it says, we will redouble efforts to substantially reduce illicit financial flows by 2030. 
with a view to eventually eliminating them, including by combating tax evasion and corruption through strengthened national regulation and increased increased international cooperation. Now, I want you to pay attention to that. I want you to pay attention to that. We will redouble efforts to substantially reduce, to substantially reduce, not eliminate, right? We are not going to eliminate, we will reduce it. And when do we reduce it by? By 2030. So by 2030, according to the projection, another $1 trillion will be done. In Lisi financial flow. Now, this is the Financing for Development meeting, which took place in Addis Ababa. The reason I'm, I'm, under, I'm under, underscoring this is for you to understand that you should not just take uh, all of these meetings and conferences and outcomes, you take them with a pinch of salt and, and uh, question them. Because where Africa is today, we don't want a reduction, we want elimination. We don't want to wait till 2030 when we lose another $1 trillion. We want it done now. And it can be done if, if we get the cooperation of the countries that are housing most of the illicit financial flows from Africa. So the paragraph goes on to say, we will also reduce opportunities for tax avoidance and consider and consider in certain anti-abuse clauses in all tax treaties. This is a very, very, very weak outcome because they will also reduce opportunities for tax avoidance. And they will consider, you know, while they are doing that, they will consider uh, in certain anti-abuse clauses. Why consider? Why not just do it? Is the question you should be asking. Why do you just say, don't abuse, uh, don't you know? Don't abuse tax. Just just put the clauses there. Lastly, we will make sure that all companies, including multinationals, pay taxes to the government of countries where economic activities occur and where value is created in accordance with national and international laws and policies. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. Uh, but the question remains. How will this be done? Can civil society organizations help? So in terms of the commercial component of illicit financial flows, what should be done? Regarding trade mispricing, African countries should ensure that they have clear and concise laws against misstating the price, quantity, quality, all the aspect of trades in goods and services in order to move capital to another jurisdiction or avoid taxation. It, that it should be coded clearly and everybody must know it. In terms of transfer pricing, African countries should establish or strengthen transfer pricing units of their countries of operation. Based on base erosion and profit shifting, we should establish arrangements for exchange of tax information between mm -hmm. African countries and global partners. In terms of regional integration arrangement, we should, be use, we should use them to introduce accepted standards for tax incentives. Now, now fifth, institutional support for measures. Uh, African countries should establish or strengthen the independent institutions and agencies responsible for preventing illicit financial flows. In many of our countries, we have, uh, we have some of these uh, We've taken action on some of these steps. There are some uh, uh, commissions dedicated to corruption, fighting corruption, uh, economic economic crimes, and so on and so forth. I know that uh, there's an official one in uh, in Kenya. There's one in Ghana. There's one in Nigeria. So now, in terms of the criminal components of IFFs, what should we do? One, we should support the African Court of Justice and Human and People's Rights, which now has jurisdiction over money laundering. We should support and implement the African Union Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption. 
we should train and empower our investigators who are responsible for identifying criminals engaged in illicit criminal activities. Each African country's financial intelligence unit should share information with other African financial intelligence units. So let us exchange information about people stealing money uh, across country and within country. We should request that the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime will extend its work on transnational organized crime in West and Central Africa to the rest of the continent. Now, in terms of the corrupt components of IFF, remember it is 5%, but 5% is also huge. What should be done? Let us integrate illicit financial flows as a specific component in the AU Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption. It is that the convention is there. We can add prevention of illicit financial flows specifically. Secondly, African states should ensure that the public can access national and subnational budget information. Third, we should adopt best practices in open contracting, uh, procurement, and so on and so forth to reduce uh, illicit financial flows. African governments can also publish lists of politically exposed persons, as well as any asset declaration filed by politically exposed persons and information about whether the country's laws prohibit or restrict the ability of their politically politically exposed person, the PEPs, to hold financial accounts abroad. Many of our countries forbid this. If you're a public, public officer, public servant, and you have an account abroad, you have an obligation to declare it. This kind of laws, uh, information should be made available across countries. So, but there are some global efforts against the illicit financial flows too, apart from what is happening within Africa. Uh, there is the law enforcement Organized Crime and Anti-Money Laundry Unit, which is at the UNODC. There is the United Nations Convention Against Illicit Traffic, Narcotic Drugs, and Psychotropic uh, Substances, as far back as 1988. There is the Global Program Against Money Laundry of 1997. There is the U.S. Patriot Act of 20, 2001, which followed the 9-11. And there is the Bank Secrecy Act in the United States, 1970. There's also the, the several conventions uh, as follows, the Financial Action Task Force, in, and all OECD plus South Africa, 40 plus nine recommendations. So Africa, the AU Summit, has a comprehensive convention dealing with money laundering. The Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption was signed by the AU Assembly of Heads of States in Maputo in 2003. And APRM, which is the African Peer Review Mechanism, our flagship initiative for good governance, uh, also deals with the issue of, uh, of uh, corruption and good governance. Now, in terms of sub-regions, ECOWAS as GEBA, which is the International Action Group, Against money laundering in West Africa, in eastern, uh, in east and southern Africa, we have the ESAAMLG, which is the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundry Group. We have uh, within MENA, we have a, a MENA FATF, which is the Middle East and North Africa Regional Financial Action Tax Force. Central Africa has GAPAC, Central Africa Action Group Against Money Laundering. So. What this means is that African countries are not just holding their arms, waiting for things to stop uh, you know, automatically. They, they have all these groupings. They're making global efforts and sub-regional efforts, but money is still living. Money is still living in the continent and affecting and having very negative impact on our development. So various countries have also taken steps to establish legislation to tighten existing laws and create anti-money anti laundry uh, mechanisms. Are these efforts working? Are these efforts working? Yes, uh, there are some success stories. 
in Nigeria, which remember is responsible for one third of the illicit financial flows and is credited with representing the single most successful case of asset recovery by state. So Nigeria has recovered billions and billions of dollars in stolen money. What is done with it is another story, you know, but it is a social story. In Egypt, there is a, a, you know, progress that is a bit slow, but they are also getting some money back. Now, there are challenges that remain. The capacity of our countries to institute control measures and to prevent, detect, and punish money laundry remains a big challenge. So if we have any idea uh, during the question and answer, it would be nice to, to, hear, to hear what your countries are doing. I know I come from Nigeria. I know that uh, uh, in spite of the success, it could, have been, it, it, it could be better and more effective. So what should be done, what should be done right now? One of the things that we, we suggest is that we have to take steps to attract new FBI with infrastructure, especially transbound infrastructure. So attract new investment. This, this is also supported by our heads of state. A few years ago, they asked uh, the ECA, the Economic Commission for Africa, to work with uh, the regional economic commissions and the African Union to kind of develop a model law, a model law for transbanding mm -hmm. infrastructural projects in Africa. So this model law was to facilitate private sector investment and financing in transboundary infrastructure projects. What are these projects? By the way, these are projects that connect more than two countries in Africa. Again, if we can get this done, our agenda in terms of regional integration becomes more robust. Now, secondly, it is to ensure transparency, efficiency, and accountability and sustainability of transboundary infrastructure. It will also harmonize cross-border regulation of transboundary infrastructure projects and promote intra-African trade as well as open domestic market to international trade. Now, what does this law look like? We have a schematic here, which is, you know, the model law framework is in eight sections and 23 articles. I spoke earlier on about uh, repatriation of, of our funds, and you will see why it is supported by our African heads of state. This law, by the way, has been endorsed uh, for uh, domestication by, our, by the African Union uh, and heads of state. So there are eight sections and 23 articles, Ooh. you know, from uh, the preambles to environmental and social standards, appointments of project regulator, investment assurances and protection, uh, free movement of entities, personnel, goods, and services, funds, finance, accounts, and fiscal regime, procurement, and dispute resolution. I will not go through these one by one. You will have the slides so you can go. And if you need the model law, you can Google it or you can write us. We have the model law in English and French. Now, let me just call attention to some, uh, some, uh, important articles uh, that you may want to pay attention to uh, because partly because they also speak to uh, the Africa Free Trade uh, Agreement, the, uh, the AFCFTA. Now there's the section three, article eight, free movement of entities, personnel, goods, and services. The article says, any entity registered, incorporated or permitted to carry on business under the laws of any African country may participate in a transboundary infrastructure project. And nothing in this act shall prohibit foreign participation. Uh, the section four says, any entity registered, incorporated or permitted to carry on business under this law shall be exempt from complying with any national legislation on the establishment of businesses, provided that such entity is registered for tax purposes in an African country. You can see that the model law, you know, really foresees the, 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 some of the challenges of illicit financial flows and take steps to make sure that 
it is uh, it, 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 it's it's countered. Now, free movement of personnel in Article 9 says that notwithstanding anything contained in law, the local content requirement, local content requirement contained here with shall not apply to employment of senior management, including but without limitation, the finance director, managing director, and other executive personnel charged with day-to-day -day management responsibility of the project vehicle. Uh, just to show you another two, and then we'll go to the, the Article 10 on immigration, then 11 on free movement of goods and services. Uh, we have procurement standards. You know, we were talking about improving, uh, improving the uh, procurement standards as one of the steps. Article 12 of the model law uh, supports that. As well as 13, we talk about the, the guiding principles. Equality, non-discrimination, um, protection and security of investment. And in terms of, and this will be the, our last slide, and then we can take questions. In terms of uh, the enabling, uh, enabling uh, authority for the model law, we have it here in 2018, African presidents endorsed, they endorsed the PIDA model law. You will see paragraph seven recalls that decision and paragraph eight welcomes and endorses the final version of the model law for transboundary infrastructure project in Africa. The, the argument here is that as we take steps against illicit financial flows, do not forget the need to attract new investment especially new investment in, in transboundary infrastructure. And to do this, countries will probably tell you we have problems going from country to another, one country to another because of language differential, because of laws, because of this, because of that. What the African heads of state have done is to say, we now have a one model law. Once you can comply with that, it does not matter what language is spoken, in, in uh, Mozambique, and uh, what language is, is spoken in South Africa. If you want to do infrastructure connecting uh, th th those two countries, you can go ahead, which is the PIDA model law compliance. So this is a very good instrument. Uh, there is a provision for, for this new resolution. And then uh, we think that as you work on that, you should, uh, you should pay attention to investment. Now, lastly, let me go to the reasoning behind the tagline, track it, stop it, get it. The whole idea of illicit financial flows, we, we, we think that number one, the number one step is for you to know where it is. Where is the money? You need to know where the money is. Once you know where the money is, then you have to take steps to stop the bleeding. Within your country, you know you track it first, then you stop it, then you start taking steps to get back the money. There has been a lot of success with, uh, with uh, Switzerland. I delivered a, a, a paper at the, at the uh, villa, you know, in, in Abuja, the presidential villa on this issue. And you know, the, the ambassador from, as, from Switzerland was there and she was you know, very, very happy to announce that in spite of all the problems, the challenges uh, involved in, uh, in repatriating money that, that, that have been lost in banks, because it takes you know, the banking secrecy act and all that, it takes years, but a lot of money has been coming out of Switzerland into some African countries. So these steps have to be taken to get back the money. What can you do? There was an application we were developing years ago. I don't know where that is now. Which was a track, you know, it was an IFF tracker, which tracks movement of funds from one country to the another. It does not insinuate any crime. It just says, oh, two hundred million dollars left Lagos this morning for uh, Brazzaville. That's it. So it is tracking in real time. Now it is left for uh, stakeholders to use the information and to find out oh, is a legitimate 
transfer. This two hundred million dollars went because uh, you know, we, we, Nigeria owes a Republic of Congo, or that a company in Nigeria actually um, has to pay. So there will be transparency. So some of these things are there. They can motivate other applications uh, from your countries. But you need to track. You need to track the movement of money. Uh, in order not to get in trouble, you don't allege what you cannot prove. You cannot say, oh, this is illicit financial flow. Money must go. Money goes around all the time. What we want to make sure is that it is not intended uh, for criminal uh, purposes. It is not, it is transparent and not opaque. And it is not depriving our continent of needed development financing. It makes no sense if somebody takes a $100 billion from your continent and then gives you 20 billion in aid. So we get to a point where we say, help us, help us stop. Help us track it, help us stop it, help us get back the money, and you can keep your aid. If you get if if we if you can you know stem the flow of the illicit uh, monies from Africa. So that is the presentation. Uh, we can have discussions. Uh, I said earlier on, if you had questions, you can stop me. If you have counter arguments, it is time to take everything. Thank you all for Thank your- Thank you very much, Prof. <coughs> Sorry, Mr. Davis. Uh, excuse me. In view of the delay, uh, we suggest, if you agree, to start the discussion without a break, as usual. Hello. Is it possible? No, I, I, I didn't hear that. What did you say? OK. I'm saying that in view of the delay, we suggest if you agree to start the discussion. Yeah, yeah, let's start. let's start. Let's start it now. OK, thank yeah. you. Uh, Chers participants, pour uh, les francophones qui ne se sont pas encore rendus compte, euh, j'ai laissé un petit résumé de la, de la présentation dans le chat. Donc, vous pouvez aussi vous en inspirer par moment pour uh, vos interventions. Alors, comme d'habitude, nous allons prendre une liste de cinq personnes. Nous prions les, les intervenants, s'il vous plaît, n'écrivez pas dans le chat parce qu'on ne peut pas voir les deux à la fois. Dans réaction, vous, vous pouvez se faire lever la main et on vous donnera la parole pour votre intervention. Donc, nous allons prendre une liste de, de cinq premiers intervenants et le professeur pourra répondre par la suite. Oui, M. Kabirou Abdou. Vous avez la... Vous avez la parole, oui. Oui, vous m'entendez? On vous reçoit. Ah ouais. eh, bonjour à tous. Eh, merci pour la brillante eh, présentation. Eh, J'ai une question par rapport à la globalisation des flux financiers à travers le monde. C'est-à-dire, je voudrais savoir, est-ce que la globalisation, c'est-à-dire la désintermédiation et la dématérialisation des des échanges à beaucoup et désamorcer euh, le trafic des flux financiers illicites à travers le monde. Merci beaucoup. Et j'aimerais aussi d'autres clarissements par rapport à... Est-ce qu'on peut dire que euh, ce, les flux illicites euh, ont contribué à l'aggravation des... De, de, de la, de sous, de, du phénomène du de sous-développement de, de, de sous à travers le continent. Généralement, je voudrais dire dans les pays en voie de développement, la mauvaise gouvernance et tout ce qui s'ensuit. Merci beaucoup. Yeah, OK. Do you want to, uh, Aime, do you want to take more or I can respond to Kabiru? Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Adeyinka. Yes. 
Okay, so uh, Mr. Abete, the tutor is uh, helping you uh, with the questions. So uh, maybe we can have a first round of questions, many questions. You, you take note and then you can answer. Sure. So he is going to, to help you because uh, some, some uh, participants uh, will raise their, their hands and then uh, we give the floor. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Paul, tu as, tu as la, la main. Hein? Il, faut, il faut gérer uh, comme l'habitude. Oui, Monsieur Bandé, s'il vous plaît. Excusez-moi, mon micro était fermé. Allez, merci bien. Euh, en tout cas, vraiment, euh, mes félicitations au professeur pour cette bonne présentation. Moi, moi, moi j'ai suivi avec intérêt effectivement la communication sur cette question effectivement de rapatrier ces, ces différentes ressources qui constituent le continent. Mais moi, je me je, 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 je sur qu'est-ce qui est fait en question des préventions. Qu'est-ce qu'on doit faire qu à partir de cet instant-là, ces gens d'action-là ne, 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 ne se répètent plus. Hein? Euh, c'est vrai qu'on on parle de la gouvernance, mais vu, je vois que pour moi, j'ai senti dans la communication que l'action est beaucoup plus, et on a mis beaucoup d'action sur comment faire pour que ces ressources-là reviennent au niveau du continent. Mais qu -ce que, quels sont ces, ces instruments-là, ces outils-là qu'on met en place pour que ça ne se répète plus, pour que les dirigeants n'arrivent plus à envoyer les ressources de l'État ailleurs Voilà, donc voilà ma préoccupation. Merci bien. Merci, M. Bandé. Euh, je prierai aux prochains intervenants francophones d'aller un peu plus doucement pour permettre euh, aux interprètes de, de faire la traduction pour euh, que le, les notes puissent être bien prises en compte. Merci. Un autre intervenant, s'il y en a. On a très peu de temps. Je prierai les intervenants de se prononcer aussi rapidement pour qu'on puisse passer. OK. Bon, euh, monsieur Adéemi, je crois que vous pouvez répondre à ces deux questions en attendant. OK. Uh, all right, thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, uh, monsieur Kabiru, you are talking about exchanges uh, and uh, illicit financial flows. I didn't particularly get what you meant by exchanges. You're talking about uh, the uh, about foreign exchange uh, regimes or stock exchanges. But what I do know is that uh, the, 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 we, 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 we cannot say that any kind of uh, any kind of a financial or monetary arrangement within countries were done to facilitate illicit financial flows. No, it, is, it, it cannot be. The truth of the matter is that when, when this transaction is illegal in its origin, in its transfer and in its utilization, you just have to know that it is not, it is not, uh, it, it is not, uh, it, somebody is trying to hide something and then it is illicit. Now, you are absolutely correct that these flows are responsible for uh, some of the underdevelopment uh, in our countries. And it is not, uh, it is also true that some of the money is stolen with the active connivance of our own people too. So uh, this is not uh, an effort to look at external offenders alone. We have to look at the whole picture. Who is enabling it within the ministry, for example? Who is uh, transferring it at the bank? Who is uh, helping somebody, uh, a, a multinational corporation, to, 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 to carry money out for a fee? Those are the things that we have to look for. And good governance, as you said, will help us. And quickly, for Mozio Bande, we say, what should we do? What should we do to stop this once and for all? I think that uh, stopping it is a process. 
we just have to continue to do it. Uh, we are presently forging partnerships with, uh, with uh, civil society organizations uh, that can put uh, the feet of these people to fire. So there are three, three things easily. Um, you know, you, you can use ICT, ICT to monitor this stuff. The people who do illicit financial flows like opaqueness, they like darkness. They don't want to be known. They don't want their names to be known. They don't want the transaction to be registered, but we can register it. There is no one dollar that moves across borders that is not known, for example, to the SWIFT, the SWIFT system. The SWIFT system knows everything. So this is why we've been pushing for exchange of transparent information. If monies are moving from one country to the other, we need to be able to know. We are not alleging anything, but we need to know whether the, the money moving uh, is, is, a, is a legitimate or not. So you can use uh, the ICT for this. Galvanize your people, mobilize them to develop applications within countries to track this kind of monies in real time. Secondly, make sure that people are punished when they are caught, no matter who they are, no matter how highly placed they are in the society. Punish the little guys, punish the big guys. Make sure that it is not nobody, make it very, very expensive for people, you know, without breaking the law. Codify all these things, as we say, as we um, mentioned during the presentation. So let it not be arbitrary because that is not useful either. Let there be a law, a codified law, that you cannot, you cannot take money out, you cannot refuse to pay taxes, you cannot avoid customs duties. If you do this, it is 10 years in jail. If you do let it be known, you know, uh, in advance by everybody. But make sure that punishment is, 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 is that short. Thirdly, thirdly, and I think we hinted on some of these things. Let us capacitate our people. The, the fighting illicit flows and take so many things. There is the control part. There is the compliance. There are people who are who are just uh, who, whose job it is to get information out, pass it on to the police. The police then pass it on to another another unit. We have to make sure they have what they need. So and we have to do this consistently. It is it is a marathon because. The people who are taking money are not, they, they, are, they, they are not about to stop. They are not about to stop and they are one step ahead of us. So we have to also be deep step with them and make sure that we know exactly what they are going to do. And we wait for them there. We, as soon as they want to do it, we make sure we stop, we stop the flow and we arrest them and we publicize them. Because remember, they don't want to be known. We must shame them, we must expose them and let people understand it. Lastly, what we were pushing some years ago was for countries within the African Union, within the United Nations, to sign an undertaking that they will support Africa's efforts at fighting illicit financial flows. Just support it. Don't impede our effort. Support our effort through uh, working with, uh, uh, what was it, uh, uh, tax, uh, tax uh, services Africa or something. We, we were able to open up a register where countries, of course, not all countries signed for some reason. Every country should be able to sign and say we support Africa's effort at fighting illicit financial flows. But this should be an ongoing thing. Any opportunity we have, let us make countries within our embassies, within our country, you know, sign a register to say we support Africa's efforts to fight uh, against illicit flows from Africa and specifically from this particular country that we are that is hosting us. So those 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 should should, should help the ICT uh, guaranteed punishment and you know naming and shaming. So that's it. We take a a couple more questions. Okay, thank you, Professor. Glory Singelo. Do you want to have a flow or can I read your question through the chat? Okay, Mr. Ademi, uh, Gloria want to know 
following the recommendation and proposal to deal with the EF of, uh, innovation. Automatic exchange of uh, tax information. Should Africa consider development a uh, continental uh, the database and statistics on tax customer and debt? She posted it in, uh, in a chat. That... OK, the, should Africa consider a continental database of tax information? My, my answer, because of my bias, will be yes, will be a resounding yes. Uh, we pay taxes, uh, though some people don't pay taxes. Uh, what is wrong? What would be so bad in having a, a continental database where you know, uh, especially with regards to the people we call PEPs, politically exposed persons, people who are charged with uh, managing our resources, national resources, are they paying taxes? Do they have a side businesses? We should be able to know this because these are indications. So my own resounding answer is yes. Now, is it practical? That is where the big, uh, the big uh, issue is. You know, because countries like to keep some, some, some of this information to themselves. Uh, many countries don't want to, you to know the, 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 the flow of the taxes, how, who is paying, who is not paying. Um, but I think that uh, as time goes on, this could be an element in the whole uh, advocacy. We could push people, we could push for in, in, the, in the interest of uh, uh, transparency that we are pushing, let us have a database. I think this is a good idea that I even will, uh, will do further study on and, and maybe integrate in a future, future presentation. I think we see Madi, Madi Wedrago, Il n'est pas là, il n'est pas là. Y a-t-il un autre intervenant? Le moins, il est le seul à lever le, la main, mais s'il a l'écoute, il a la, la, la parole. Ou s'il y a un autre intervenant, il est prié de lever la main, s'il vous plaît. OK. Je... Il y a deux nouveaux intervenants. Euh, Monsieur Kabirou, vous allez euh, poser votre question après Venance Ido. Ok, merci beaucoup. On reçoit d'abord Ido, s'il vous plaît. Venance. Oui, je suis Kabirou du Niger. Je suis de la République du Niger, en Afrique de l'Ouest. Okay. C'est bon? Voilà. Et j'aimerais savoir, est-ce que réellement il y a une corrélation entre le flux illicite, le flux financier illicite et le phénomène du terrorisme. OK, merci. Euh, on va prendre Venance et le professeur vous pourra euh, vous répondre. Oui, bonjour tout le monde. Allô, bonjour. Oui, bonjour Venance. On vous reçoit. Oui, je suis, que... okay. je suis très content de cette présentation. Euh, mais... J'ai une question, la question de savoir est-ce que l'Union africaine, oui, africaine ne peut pas créer une structure qui pourra prendre en charge la gestion de ces flux illicites dans le continent, dans le, dans le, dans le continent africain afin de permettre de pouvoir un temps soit peu corriger ces flux qui échappent aux, aux, pays, aux pays africains alors qu'il est très important pour le développement en Afrique. Est-ce qu'on peut envisager l'Afrique, oui, l'Afrique en tel pas envisager à une structure qui se, qui se prend en charge de la gestion de ces flux illicites dans le, dans le continent africain? Euh, 
Donc, c'est la seule question qui m'est venue, que, que j'ai voulu poser. Merci. Oui, merci à vous, Venance. Pour le moment, il n'y a pas d'autres intervenants. Monsieur Ademi. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, let me take uh, uh, Mosul Kabiru quickly uh, from Niger. Is there a correlation between uh, illicit financial flows and terrorism? I think anecdotally, the answer is yes. We, we, that, that is, that's one reason. And in fact, uh, without necessarily mentioning countries, uh, we have seen that the re one of the reasons people keep money when, when they hide it, one of the reasons they hide it from a, from a record is because they do not want you to know what they are using the money for. If you are using the money, for example, to pay scholarship for 200, 2,000 of your citizens in, in, a, in one country, you won't have to hide it. But if you want a part of it to go to a terrorist group, which is illegal uh, in a particular country, then you will have to hide it. This is why, uh, you know, we, when we we're talking about global efforts, you saw some of the, the, the efforts in the, in the United States. That's one of the reasons after 9-11 that some of these laws came up to track money. You know, right now, if you take more than $10,000 into any country, you have to declare it. And once you declare it, they start investigating where is it from, what is it going to do, what are you going to do with it, uh, and this is the way that countries check uh, the, the, the flow so that it does not get into, because one way of stopping the activity of uh, terrorists is to follow the money and, and just, just make sure that the money does not get there. They need money to buy equipment. They need money to buy guns, to buy all sorts of things that they use. I don't know what they use. Uh, but they need money. So if you follow the money, usually you'll be able to, 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 to at least track. You'll be able to track it and then to stop it, then it depends on your, on your own effort within the country. So my, my guess is that there's a direct correlation. Uh, to uh, Monsieur Venance, can the AU put in place a structure, uh, I guess we're talking about a permanent structure to monitor and uh, work on uh, on this so that you can control and remedy this financial flow. I think this is a very good 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 uh, suggestion. Although I know that the African Union uh, is not very uh, you know, uh, enthusiastic about new structures. Uh, the, what it likes to do is see whether it can accomplish some of these lofty objectives using the structure that exists right now. Now, keep in mind that it was the African Union that established the high level panel. The 10 uh, distinguished people, chaired by uh, former president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, uh, it was, it was uh, the African Union that did it. And after that, the African Union has uh, also said, go ahead and in, you know, implement the recommendations of the panel. You see, this is where, this is uh, as far as it can go. Uh, in terms of, uh, he has said, look, now we know we know where the money is. Now we know how the, why, how the money is going out. Go ahead and make sure you stop this in your countries. And we will give you the enabling laws and conventions, which the African Union has. The, there are conventions uh, against this stuff. So we have to strengthen them. Now, what we need to do, uh, generally, uh, gentlemen and ladies, is we have to keep talking about it in our countries. We have to keep talking about it. If you need for that technical support, we have a whole division at ECA uh, we, that has a section that is dedicated to 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 this uh, to illicit financial flows work as part of the work on governance. So they will they will be able to help you. But you have to keep talking about this. Grant press interviews. Read more about these issues and talk authoritatively about it because the truth of the matter is that more money is leaving our continent on a, on a day to day basis. And we have to be able to help our government to say, okay, listen, uh, we know you cannot do it all. This is what we can do. Or I am a businessman. 
I have a, 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 a you know an application uh, development firm, and I can help you develop an application that will track the money. Let us also help our government because the government cannot do it alone. Government needs information, and information requires some kind of a techno technology these days, so that you know exactly what is happening. I ask you not to make, do not make any uh, uh, any allegation that you cannot substantiate, because you don't want to you don't want to uh, end up in jail uh, for maligning people's character. But applications that will say money left this spot for the other spot. Period. That's it. We're just saying money is moving. We are not saying uh, it is stolen money. So this is this is critical. Let us help our government. Uh, let us encourage the media to take this up. Establish groups. Establish a media, you know, uh, social media uh, groups on illicit financial flows, or join existing ones to talk about the particular experiences in your within your countries, because things happen. Uh, you know, there, there's a variation in terms of the impact. Countries are big, countries are small. The impact of illicit flows in Burundi, for example, is not going to be the same in, as in South Africa. So uh, the smaller the economy, the more, uh, uh, the, 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 the greater the, uh, the negative impact of illicit flows. So we have to, we must not keep quiet. Uh, let us expose it. You know, illicit flows, lives, darkness, opaqueness. We must expose them. Uh, we don't accuse anybody, but if you are not paying taxes, we have to know. Companies that have been in business in our country for 30, 40 years and are not paying taxes, they are killing our people. They are, they are, they are, they are preventing uh, uh, you know, the health systems to, to be more efficient, in the educational systems, because they are not paying taxes. Security uh, cannot, be, cannot be optimal because they are not paying taxes. If we know them, we have to ask them, why are you still in business 40 years after when you are not making profit? Because that's what they say. Oh, we can't pay tax because we are not making profit. You should not be in business if you are not making profit for 40 years. Something is there. Let us investigate them. Let us be able to hold their feet to fire and stop this. If you stop the bleeding, then you can start taking steps to get back the money. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you, Mr. Ademi. Uh, y a-t-il un autre intervenant? Are there any other speaker? Okay, Mr. Ademi, I don't see any more hand raised. Let me then, let me then uh, thank everybody. Okay, uh, so, sorry, uh, there are Venus. Huh? Oh, okay. Venus, hello? Oui, Venus, oui, oui. oui. Vous, pouvez, vous voulez intervenir? Oui, mais... C'est l'ancienne main. Oui, non, c'est la nouvelle main. Okay, je prends d'abord M. Abdou Razak. Okay. Et après, vous, 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 vous allez. Oui. Abdou Razak. Okay. Monsieur, Ab Monsieur Abdoulé en ligne. Oui, merci beaucoup. S'il vous plaît, il nous reste très peu de temps. Merci beaucoup, c'est Monsieur Djibril Abdou Razak du Togo. J'aimerais intervenir sur les fausses factures dans le cadre du commerce international. Comment les pays africains ou bien les pays en développement pourront lutter contre les flux financiers illicites dans le sens des fausses factures de fausses facturations dans le commerce international. Merci. OK, merci pour votre question. Monsieur Venance. Oui, merci beaucoup, Monsieur Petit. Tout à l'heure, le professeur a parlé d'une formation sur le... sur l'application des étudiants. Si les jeunes en veulent avoir cette formation, est-ce qu'il est disponible pour nous le faire Bon, et, 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 et quels sont les rouages, quelles sont les, 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 les conditions pour avoir cette formation 
question-là. C'est ma question. Merci beaucoup. OK, merci. Il n'y a pas d'autres mal levé. Monsieur Adeyemi. Mm. Thank you, thank you, thank you, colleagues. Um, let me just, let me start with the answer. Yeah, uh, the, the answer is yes. Uh, and all you have to do really is request. Uh, our training arm is EDEP. And EDEP has the, the, the capability to develop curriculum around these issues uh, targeted at your specific needs. So um, my, my suggestion would be, um, you know, do it in terms of uh, uh, at the country level, for example, uh, or at the level of uh, some organized private sector and ask uh, EDEP, you know, identify the problem, ask them for assistance, uh, you know, in, in putting together a capacity uh, development or capacity enhancement uh, session. And they will do it. Secondly, you have access to our, our reports, our reports there have been uh, several reports on this topic that you can find on our website, uh, you know, unca.org, um, as well as uh, the, our social media handles. Uh, thirdly, uh, we can keep the conversation going. I am on Twitter at YADME. My last name, just you know, with uh, Y at the beginning, uh, so we can keep this going. So the answer is yes, we 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 can support training. Now to Abdullah, the uh, sorry Abdul, uh, in terms of trade misinvoicing, I think and we did mention it in the slide, and I hope that I hope that Idep makes the slides available to all of you. You know, people do what they can get away with especially foreign companies. If they come to, this is what I was saying, if a, a corrupt country goes to any African country and they can get away with so many things because there are no laws specifically forbidding those things. Or when there are those laws, they can be broken easily because the, the systems to monitor, regulate and punish are very weak. Therefore, because they will not do this in other countries, where the systems to monitor, regulate, and punish are strong. They will not do this kind of misinvoicing. So uh, therefore, what you must do is make sure that the country, your country, strengthens its own internal regulations, the internal capacity to monitor, to monitor some of these flows, to monitor the trade and misinvoicing, to monitor it, and then to investigate it, and bring the people uh, to, to, to book. They must be punished, not only punished, they must pay what they owe. Because for every dollar that they, 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 they rob from Africa, people are dying. Our schools cannot function properly. Hospitals cannot function. We cannot maintain, we cannot secure our, our, our population because monies are flowing out. We must stop it by strengthening our own internal mechanisms, internal regulations, uh, and the capacity to punish, to monitor, and to and, and to and so that the people will uh, it will create a deterrence for other people, and they will say, ah, let me not go to country A uh, because uh, there's likelihood that I will be stopped, I will be caught. Uh, then they will go to another country and find the same thing. So and this is this is how it has to go within your country have the internal regulations strengthened and and then used yeah uh, and that's it um i don't think i don't see any hands uh anymore um yes uh i mean are we uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Yinka, I think that uh, we are close to the end of um, this live session. I can see a, a, a hand raised, maybe yeah, we'll exactly the last question, and then we, we close. Yeah,
Monsieur Alassane Ali. Ok, mais je crois que... So it seems that Mr. Alassane is not online, so uh, we can conclude, uh, Mr. Yinka. Yes, thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your dedication and uh, for, to uh, follow this presentation. And I hope that we can continue the conversation. But the critical thing is that we, we have to take action. We have to support our government. Uh, we have to understand that even the people, some of the enablers of IFF may be within government. We have to, we have to work to as, expose them because not everybody in government is, uh, is, uh, is taking part in this. People who are charged with managing our economies, our resources, do not want people stealing the money because then, then they cannot do their job. So we have to help. Um, and let us, uh, uh, as we said, if you need further assistance, technical support, please contact uh, IDEP. Uh, IDEP will put it together. Make sure, thirdly, that this is a continuous process. We must track it, we must stop it, and we must get back the money. And then once we get it back, we make sure that we use it for the development of Africa. Do not listen to people who say to you, if we return the money, you people are going to steal it and all that. I had this one time in, in the United Nations uh, meeting in New York and I from a, a, a colleague from the World Bank. And what I told him is, it is not your business to tell us what we do if you return the money you stole. You have no right to steal our money first. So this thing can get combative sometimes. So, uh, once we get back the money, then we go to the next step of ensuring that it is used for the, uh, the, the purpose of developing uh, our economies and making sure that our, our, country, our citizens uh, do, do you know, uh, get the dividend of democracy. So thank you all again. And i would see you around uh, maybe on Twitter or uh, any other social media. Let's keep the conversations going. Thank you all. Okay, uh, before we close, I would Merci like also to, to thank you. Uh, before we close, I would like also to, to, thank, to thank you, Mr. Adeyemi, for your brilliant presentation. For, yes, you, you took uh, your time to, to deliver this presentation. I think it was very rich uh, for the participants. And uh, what we can keep in mind is uh, that we, we should make effort together to track and stop illicit financial flows throughout the continent. And uh, I think the, the discussion is very interesting and uh, the, uh, that, con that can continue through our discussion forums for those who may like to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to raise some issues uh, that they could not do today or those who, are up, those who were absent today. So maybe, uh, yes, as I said, you can uh, post your questions in the discussion forum that we have for this course. And uh, Mr. Adeyemi, who is a, an expert on the, the topic matter, will uh, respond. Uh, so I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Paul Abete, uh, who is also dynamic, very active. Uh, thank you, Paul, for all your efforts to make this uh, course a success. Uh, I would also like to thank <clears throat> all my colleagues from the technical team uh, for the, the support. And uh, of course, the interpreters who facilitate uh, these sessions and uh, make sure that we can understand ourselves in both English and French. Uh, I thank uh, the participants because uh, there is no course without uh, trainees. So I thank all the participants uh, for the dedication and uh, for uh, following uh, all the live sessions that we plan this year to uh, improve the delivery of this course. So the course is not yet uh, uh, finished. So we will continue during two weeks. 
So if you have uh, questions, if you have any issue that you would like to raise, our tutor, Mr. Paul is there, our facilitator, Mr. Adeyemi is there for uh, questions related to EDC financial flows. And uh, the course director is also uh, supervising the, the whole process. So uh, uh, I will end here and uh, hope that uh, uh, many of you will be able to, to take the course until the end because uh, we still have uh, some weeks to go. So thank you to everybody and uh, see you. Bye-bye.